All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. My name is Adrian Ilesio. I'm a developer advocate with Cisco Developer Relations, uh, where I cover enterprise networking technologies such as Cisco Catalyst SD-WAN, Cisco DNA Center, Meraki, and iOS XE. The webinar today is REST API Basics and the Cisco Catalyst SD-WAN REST API. So we're going to talk about REST API basics. If you're just getting started with what an API is, what REST is, and also if you're new to Cisco uh, Catalyst SD-WAN, this is the webinar for you. Thank you so much for all for joining and let's get started. We have a packed agenda today. We're going to start with what it, what is an API. And then we're going to have a look at REST as an API framework that's very popular these days. Uh, we'll have a look uh, under the hood at REST, how it works, what are the components that come into the picture when we talk about REST. We'll have a couple of examples of REST interfaces and then also tools that you could use as you start developing, testing uh, your own REST API interfaces. Once we cover that, we'll move on to what is Cisco Catalyst SD-WAN. And you'll see there's some renaming that has been taking place recently on Cisco SD-WAN, the Viptela-based one. So there's some um, renaming that's going on that's happening. Uh, we're calling it Cisco Catalyst SD-WAN. You'll see uh, what we used to be vManage is now called Manager, Cisco SD-WAN Manager. Uh, so I have incorporated the new naming changes in my presentation. So you'll be able to get familiar with, with the new nomenclature and the new names for uh, all these components of the sd one fabric. So once we covered that, we'll move into the sd one Manager REST API. We'll look, have a look at the REST API interface that uh, the manager provides and how to interact with it. And then we'll wrap up with conclusions at the end. If you have any questions during the webinar, please drop them in the questions uh, option in Bright Talk, and we'll address them as they come along. Uh, and also, we'll uh, we'll have a bit of time at the end to answer your questions as uh, as they come in. All right, so let's get started. What is an API? So you can think of an API. Uh, or an application programming interface as a way for two pieces of software to talk to each other, right? That's pretty much what it stands for, what it, uh, what it is. So what that means is that for the longest time, humans were the only users of computer interfaces, right, of computers. So you can think of users asking for data, or taking actions by interacting with the user interface that's being provided by a laptop, uh, a personal computer, a server somewhere by a computing device. So humans were interacting, were getting the data back um, from, the, uh, from the software that they were using. But for the past, probably 15, 20 years, maybe even more, what happened is that um, the users of software have also become another software systems, right? So we have these concatenations of software systems interacting with each other. So the requirements for them are a bit different, right? They're, they're machines interacting with other machines. They don't need to have a pretty user interface, right? So um, that's why API interfaces have, have come to exist by providing these interfaces specifically designed for other software systems uh, as they go through. So software you see here, ask for data or takes action by interacting with the API of a different software system. And that software system uh, returns the results via that API interface. So you can think of the API also as the user interface for software systems, right? Similar to how uh, humans have web pages to interact with web servers or graphical user interfaces to interact with software. Um, APIs are these user interfaces, but for software systems. 
So APIs at the same time are a set of requirements that govern how one application can talk to another. So there's also a set of rules or, or contracts, what we call, that each API has to adhere to. So you can think of an example that we like to give for an API is, you can think of an API as an electrical outlet, right? So what it'd be like to power any electronic device without an outlet, right? You would have just the wires in your, uh, in your wall. You would have to open the wall. You would have to strip the wires. You have to splice the wires together. You have to understand the wires in the wall. And And then, right, you would have to figure all of this out by yourself. Or you could take advantage of the outlet that's in the wall, and it provides a standard way of providing power to you. So sockets deliver 120 volts in the US of alternating current operating at 60 hertz. Uh, and then you set the expectations on behalf of consuming devices and providers. So that means that whoever develops or electronics equipment, right? Hair dryers, vacuum cleaners, computers, they can develop them with these specifications in mind, with this following the standard, having a common plug um, and everything comes together once you start having uh, these standards in place and these contracts. The question is, uh, someone asked the question, the presentation slides are in the attachment. Yes, they are. So you should be able to find uh, the slides of the presentation in the um, in Bright Talk over here for you to download and follow along if you want. So an API is best thought as a contract provided by one piece of computer software to another, right? Like we were saying, those standards, um, the rules that come in place and what services one API interface provides to the other. Um, another example with the power of the APIs is with Yelp and how it works in conjunction with Google Maps, right? So Yelp, if you're not familiar, is an app that provides restaurant recommendations for folks, it has a list of reviews for all the restaurants, right? And it can show you restaurants around you. So what happened is that for Yelp, to be able to show uh, restaurants around you, they need access to a map. So for them, instead of developing a map service from scratch, right? Their main business is not map uh, APIs or delivering map uh, information to users. Their, their their main business is to provide restaurant information around you. So, what they app uh, what they ended up doing is they uh, are using the Google Maps API to get location information. So that provides a very important functionality for for their application that they don't need to develop themselves. They just need to go and interact with the Google Maps API. Google Maps API will return the information regarding the location of the user. And then based on that, Yelp can figure out in their database, oh, you're in this part of the world. We see based to the information that we receive from Google Maps, then it means that these are the restaurants within a certain area from you, right? So very important for, uh, for Yelp to have access to a map information uh, through this Google Maps API. So because of this, you can create same thing with applications like Uber, right? They get location uh, from another location uh, API. They don't need to build a location service or a mapping service themselves. They just get that information from an API. Mind you, there might be a cost associated with you know getting this information for them but it's still much cheaper at the end of the day than having to, to create a whole mapping uh, or location service and maintaining it and, uh, and all of that. So 
Because of this, we also say that APIs are often referred to as an engine of innovation, right? Because they create who knows what, right? The, the opportunities out there, once you start exposing data over APIs, are unlimited because everyone and anyone can take, start taking advantage of these interfaces and build their own applications uh, and build their own solutions on top of these APIs. All right, so that was about APIs, application programming interfaces. Uh, I hope it's clear for all of you now if it wasn't before. So now let's move and uh, talk about REST. So what is REST? REST stands for Representational State Transfer, and it is an API framework that's built on top of HTTP, right? So there are many other uh, API platforms out there. There's uh, SOAP, there's Java-based, there's uh, uh, API platforms. There's, there's many other ones. The most popular, or the one we're going to talk about today, is the REST API framework. So APIs in this case are referred to as web services and uh, the REST framework is very popular due to the performance, the scale, simplicity, and reliability. So it's very easy to build services and to build APIs on top of a REST framework. And this is because it runs on top of HTTP or hypertext transfer protocol and everything, every everyone is familiar with HTTP. Everyone has, well, most everyone has been using a browser to interact with the web server over HTTP. So it's very easy to consume uh, APIs over the same interface of HTTP. So how it works, uh, there's requests and responses between a, a client and a server. So you see here, Carl on the left-hand side is making an HTTP request. It is a get call and we'll see what, uh, what that means in a bit but it's just for retrieving data from a server that's located at this URI, Uniform Resource Identifier, right? So it's a devi slash API slash hello. So it sends a request to that server. The devi server takes that request, processes it, and then returns a response back to Carl Right, it's an HTTP response, very similar to sending a, a kind of a website back. And you got a status code over there of 200 K and you got a JSON payload of, hey, this is the data they requested. Here you go, here's the response um, in formatted in, uh, in JSON um, data. So let's have a look at under the hood, what's happening with REST. I briefly mentioned the URI, so the Uniform Resource Identifier. It's basically specifying what are you requesting? What is the, the URI, the link that you want to access uh, through the API? So there's several different components that come into the picture when we talk about URIs for REST, uh, for REST uh, framework. First of all, you see it is HTTP or HTTPS. So this defines either if it's secure HTTP or just regular HTTP. Uh, and following that, you have the server or the host name. Here is uh, maps.googleeps.com. So this is uh, the, the server that you're trying to access. And this usually would resolve, uh, of course, using DNS to an IP address that you would connect to. And then in some cases, you have here a colon or semicolon, and you specify the port also if it's not running on uh, port 80 for HTTP or 443 for HTTPS. So you might have uh, 8443 or another custom port, you would have to specify it with that se semicolon. Then um, you have a slash, and so you got to the server, you're there. Now from that server, what exact resource you want to access. And resources are organized hierarchically in a tree-like structure. So they start at the top, right? And then you have the slashes specifying uh, which part of the tree you want to go down to and retrieve information from. 
So the resource here is the location of the data or object of interest on the server. So you see here slash maps, slash API, slash geocode, slash JSON would return, would specify the resource that I want to access on that uh, REST API interface. And then last but not least, you can pass in parameters. After the question mark here, we see we have a address of San Jose. So parameters are, you know, they're there to provide filters, clarity of a request, uh, details of a scope. So to limit the scope of the request, I want to return the address only for the San Jose area here. I don't want all the addresses and they're often optional. So these are the four main components, right? HTTP or HTTPS, you specify that it is an HTTP request. You specify the server or the host with uh, any custom ports. If it's not uh, the default ones, then you specify the resource where exactly um, is the resource that I'm trying to access on that server. And once you have specified the resource, you can also specify filters using the parameters after the question mark um, to limit or to, uh, to filter the output that you're getting back from the server. Another main component of REST are the HTTP methods. So these are your typical HTTP methods that you can find out there and they're, you've, they've been used for web servers and web services for the long time. REST APIs are just taking advantage of them. So it's basically the HTTP methods specify what you want to do. You want to post, which means creating data you use to create a new object or resource uh, for example, you would add a new book to the library. Get get calls are usually used to read information, to retrieve resource details from the system. So it's like get a list of books from the library. Put and patch are used for updating information. So um, the information is right there. Put is typically used to replace or update the resource and can also be used to modify or create. Well, a patch is used to modify some details about a resource, right? So change the author of a book in our example. And then you have, of course, delete if you want to remove information or remove resource from the system. Example, uh, deleting a book from the library would be using the delete verb and would be the delete purpose, delete function that's being used. So create, read, update, and delete the CRUD um uh, uh options operations that are available here you can see get post put patch and delete right so you have all the four five main uh operations and the methods that come with them another component is the response status code. So you want to make sure that it did it work or not. So you're actually getting this information back through response codes from the server. So response codes are um, coded in three digit numbers you can see here. So the 200s are usually a status code means that everything went well, the request was uh, processed successfully. So even, either if it's a, a get call, you're retrieving information or you're creating new resources, you know, API. If you get a 200, uh, 201 for created uh, status code, that means that the information was created successfully or retrieved successfully or processed successfully by the server. If you get status codes within the 400 range, 400, 401, 3, 4, uh, there's been a problem with your request, right? So it's a user side problem. There was something wrong. The request is bad uh, or is invalid. The resource doesn't exist. Uh, you're not authorized a 401. That means that the um, authentication is missing or incorrect. Uh, 403 is forbidden. Um, you request has been understood, but the user is not allowed to perform that request. Same thing with 404, not found. The resource has not been found on, on the server. So as the 400 status codes usually mean that um, there's a problem on the user side. 500 
uh, and status codes in the 500 range mean that there's a problem on the server side. All right, so we have a 500 uh, status code that is an internal server error. There's something wrong with the server or a 503 service unavailable, service unable to complete the request for whatever reason the server is overloaded. The server is uh, maybe not started or is in a crash state. So there's a problem on the server side. And then 300 status code, we don't have it here, but is usually redirect. So it's um, a status code that specified that, hey, the resource that you're trying to access has been moved and you have the redirected information. You can find it uh, at this new URI. So these are the status codes, 200s, it's okay. 300s, redirects, 400s are usually um, problems on the user side and then 500s, problems or issues on the server side. Headers, this is another component that's important uh, in our REST API framework, and they contain details and metadata, uh, metadata. So what this means is that you can have headers. Uh, we have, for example, a sphere of content type. So for content type headers, um, you see an example of application slash JSON, they specify the format of data in the body, right? So this is, I'm sending information to a server as a client, so I'm, I'm telling through the header to the server that, hey, I'm sending you JSON data or XML or YAML or whatever type of data. I'm having this encoded, this type of information encoded in the content type header so that the server knows when it receives this request, it looks at the content type and knows right away that, yes, it's expecting to data to be encoded in the uh, format that the content type is specifying. JSON, like I said, XML, um, YAML, CVS, and so on and so forth. Accept header on the other side is specifying the requested format for return data. So I'm telling the server, hey, I'm accepting data in uh, this specific format. So application slash JSON in our example here, I'm telling to the accept header if I have this information there with application JSON, a server, when you send back the information to me, please send it in JSON format or XML or YAML or what have you. So the accept header is telling the server what you're accepting as a client, what format you'd prefer to get that response back in. Authorization, right? You would have Authorization headers, they would contain credentials to authorize a request. So you could have different types of authorizations as we'll see in the next slide. And then date would be another header. This would specify uh, the date and time of the message. So headers are used to pass information between client and server. Like I was saying uh, included in both request and response. And some APIs will use custom headers for authentication or other purposes. So you'll have to read on that API and see if you need to create custom headers or what type of information those headers should contain. So this will be all documented in the REST API documentation. Data, this is sending and receiving. So it's containing the body of the request, what we call um, post, put, patch requests typically include data. So they have a body or a payload um, that they actually send to the server for creating or updating that new information, right? You kind of have to have uh, what information you're creating. So that will be contained or updating that will be contained in the body as part of the data payload that you're sending to the, uh, to the API server. Get responses also will include data. So the response that you get back from the server will have data into the body. So it will be organized ideally based on the accept header that you requested the server to reply in, in that format. So it would have JSON body with all the information contained in uh, an organized nice in a JSON format for you. And then format typically are JSON or XML and check the content type header for, for that. Authentication and security, like I was saying, so there's none. 
uh, in that case, the web API resource is public. Anybody can place a call. You can have basic HTTP or username and password are passed to the server in an encoded string. You can see here authorization, basic and encoded string. Base64 is a popular encoding algorithm here to encode both username and password into a, a, a garbled up piece of text that you can use to actually authenticate and send to the server. This token-based authentication, which uh, in that case is a secret generally retrieved from a web API developer portal. And the keyword is API dependent. So you have here authorization token, right? Uh, this is token-based. Or you can have OAuth, and this is a OAuth authentication. And this is a standard framework for a flow to retrieve an, uh, an access token from an identity provider. So you might have seen um, these days where you can you know, log in with your Gmail account, for example, into all types of application or your Facebook account, right? You could log in into a, a third party application by using your Gmail or Facebook or Twitter account. So these are all using this auth, OAuth uh, authentication framework. And then authorization can be short-lived uh, and usually requires a refreshing of the tokens. After a certain amount of time, you'll have to refresh uh, the token uh, or the OAuth access token in that case, because you don't want these tokens to be living uh, indefinitely. All right, so REST API uh, examples we have here. If you haven't, if you weren't aware, there is a, an internet Chuck Noise database. <laughs> And this is a, um, a nice REST API um, framework, right? It's a REST API that's providing jokes, Chuck Norris jokes. So it's uh, hosted at api.icndb.com, right? Slash API, that's the API endpoint. It's, uh, no authentication is needed, so it's an open API. And it is well constructed with many uh, API options. So you can see here, you can pass in um, a parameter with limit to nerdy, so uh, return only nerdy jokes. Um, it's very useful for testing on just you know getting accustomed to REST API um, to the REST API framework to how REST API works. And you see here uh, the requests are done with curl we'll see curl is one of the tools that you can use to interact with REST API interfaces, right? It's just a, a Linux, Unix-based utility that is uh, used to perform HTTP, HTTPS requests to a web server and also um, parsing the information that you receive back. Okay, so natural programmability with RESCOMP, you have the request. Uh, same with curl here, we're using RESCOMP. So dash u provides the user and password for basic authentication. Uh, uh, dash h sets the headers. And then you have here a request for um, getting the information pertaining to interface gigabit ethernet two on this endpoint, which is a CSR 1000V running in our uh, always on sandbox. So this will, retrieve information pertaining to that interface and it's organized in JSON format. And these are the headers that are being returned. 200 okay, it means it's that status code we see here. We see the date, we see that content type, application, Yang data plus JSON, right? Uh, so we see all those headers, all those informations and also the body of our response containing the information that we're interested in right here. So REST tools. What you can use, I briefly mentioned curl as a Linux command line application. There's also Postman. We'll have a look on Thursday during our workshop on how to use Postman, uh, the application to interact with uh, REST APIs. There's the requests library in Python um, and many other ones, URL, URL lib and many others requests will be one of the more popular ones. Python library to interact with REST uh, API endpoints with HTTP web servers. There's Swagger for dynamic API documentation. We'll have a look also at this, uh, at the Swagger spec for, um, for the SD-WAN uh, manager server. 
And there's also browser developer tools. So if you go in your browser, you go to uh, developer tools, you're able to see all the API calls going back in um, between client and server between your browser and the REST API server going on in the back end. You'll be able to intercept all those calls and have a look at them and um, extract important information about how the API works that way. All right, so that covered what is uh, API, what is REST tools, right? We had a look, we had a look under the hood at REST APIs, what are all the components and how they come together. So now let's go ahead and talk about what is Cisco Catalyst SD-WAN. So for the longest time, these boxes, right, these routers we're using for wide area networks. You see here, uh, this is a, a very old one, an old one, but uh the way routers and switches have worked for the longest time is pretty much the same right so we have these boxes with different components in them we see here the control plane module usually these would be the supervisor cards and this is where your control plane is is working uh, you would have your routing protocols in here you also have your management interface right you can connect to the device to manage it uh you would have your first hub redundancy protocols running on your control plane modules all the intelligence uh, that comes and all the features that come with these devices from a software perspective uh, are running in the control plane usually then you have your io modules and these are just cards modules that are forwarding data traffic from your customers from your clients that are connected to the network right so these will be where you connect and their, their purpose is to forward traffic as fast as possible. And then you have in the back end here of the box, the switch fabric, and that's basically just an interconnection, meta interconnection between all these modules and making sure that um, electrical circuit, electrical signals are being passed between all these modules and data is being uh, forwarded between all of them. <clears throat> so from this, modular, right? But in a box uh, architecture, what happened with SD-WAN is that they split all these components into different um, servers and different uh, architecture. So we see here the Cisco SD-WAN architecture, you have your control panel module has been separated into different components. You have the manager, we have the validator, we have the controllers. So that is what used to be called the V-Bond. Now we call it a validator. And then the controllers are what used to be called vSmart servers. We're calling them controllers now in our SD-WAN architecture. So all of these are uh, part of the control plane module, right? And then the switch fabric has also actually become your internet connectivity, your 5Gs, your MPLS circuits. These have become your switch fabric that are interconnecting all these components. And then the IO modules are your edge routers, right? Your uh, ISRs, your all Vitella the appliances, uh, they're all part of your IO modules that are actually forwarding data for your customers as fast as possible. There's secure connectivity, of course, here between your control plane and your IO modules, but it's over uh, the internet or 5G circuits or MPLS. So let's talk quickly about the validator <clears throat> or what it used to be called VBON. So it, it's part of the orchestration plane and it orchestrates control and management plane. It is the first point of authentication for all your edge devices and it distributes a list of controllers, of managers to uh, the edge routers, facilitates net traversal and is the only component that requires universally reachable IP address and port. Uh, right, so the the edge routers need to be able to connect only to the validator for access to the SD-WAN fabric and to come online. It can be multi-tenant or single tenant, um, and that's the validator. The next component is the controllers, or used to be vSmart. They facilitate fabric discovery. They uh, disseminate control plane information between edge devices. Uh, it distributes the data plane policies to the edge devices, so it pushes policies to all these devices, and also implements control plane policies uh, through the fabric. 
edge devices. These are your secure data plane with remote edge devices. These are what's giving customers connection to the fabric. Establish a secure control plane with the controllers using OMP. Uh, implements data plane policies, supports zero touch deployment, and then of course supports traditional routing, first top redundancy, all those features come with uh, the edge routers and they can be physical or virtual appliances. And then last but not least, the management plane or the manager. You see here, it is the single pane of glass for day zero, day one, day two operations. Uh, it contains a centralized provisioning, monitoring and troubleshooting. So your interaction with the SD-WAN fabric is through the manager or what used to, call, what used to be called the vManage server. It is multi-tenant or single tenant policies and templates are being defined here. Uh, Role-based access control is enforced. Of course, you can have admins, different roles as part of your fabric. And then for um, our presentation today, the most important aspect is that it has a programmatic REST API interface. So all these components, why they have been split into different um, servers is for scalability purposes, right? So we've seen that if you split your control plane into different components, your fabrics can scale to hundreds of thousands, tens of hundreds of thousands of, of devices, right? So we can have these huge SD-WAN fabrics once we start splitting functionality into different components. All right, so that's the uh, Catalyst SD1 architecture and the components. So the manager, SD1 manager REST API. So like I was saying, the manager provides a REST API interface, like we've seen previously what it, uh, a REST API means and, uh, and how it works. So to get access to the Swagger implementation and the Swagger is, uh, the Swagger spec, what it's called, or the open API spec, it's basically just a list of all the API, uh, of all the API endpoints that are available with that um, API interface, right? So you see here they're organized for um, vManage or the manager. They're organized under administration, certificate, collocation, so on and so forth in these groupings. And once you expand each one of these, you get, for example, your calls right your posts gets puts deletes here on how to add a new system to the device uh, a new device to the system right to the fabric or how to update it or how to get information about it or how to remove it from the fabric and use the delete uh, api call so these all this information um, is available on the manager server itself so once you do HTTPS, you put in the host name or the IP address of your SD-WAN manager and then slash API docs would be the endpoint that gives you access to the Swagger open API spec for the REST API uh, that's running on the manager itself. So the API exposes pretty much all the functionality that you can do in the graphical interface, right? So as you monitor, manage, configure your SD-WAN fabric, what happens is that every click that you do on the GUI, it's actually a REST API call in the backend that happens to update the graphical user interface. Like I was saying, you can see all these calls and how uh, how they work and what's happening between the GUI and the backend using those developer tools in your browser. Right, so you see all the API calls, and we'll have a look at this on Thursday on uh, how. Uh, the APIs uh, are being accessed from the GUI or the graphical interface of vManage or manager now, and how that information is being retrieved and displayed to the user. So you have here, right, you expand the configuration device inventory. And then if you click on any of these API calls, you actually get to see how the, uh, the call looks. Right? So we see here a get call for system, device, controllers, vEdge status. So this is that um, path to the resource, to the VH status resource here, uh, how it looks in curl, the request URL, what it is, it's all of it here, right? And then you have the response body, the headers, 
uh, and all this information. And you have the option of, you see here this button, try it out. So you have the option of actually clicking on that and performing that API call into the GUI itself. And then we'll retrieve that information. You see here, uh, that's how it looks. All right, so here is where everything comes together. A get call, that would be the method, right? This would be the URI. Uh, well, this would be the URL or uh, URI that's being accessed, all of it on that specific server, slash data service, slash system, slash device, slash controller, slash VEdge, slash status would return the status of all your VEdge um, devices in the SD1 fabric. Um, right, documentation. So if you don't have a vManage or a manager or your, your own SD1 fabric, you can access the documentation on developer.cisco.com slash doc slash SD1. This would be pretty much very similar, but besides the API reference, you have the change log to see what happened from one version to the next. You have quick start guides. You have developer resources with learning labs to get you started if you're not familiar with, uh, with SD-WAN. And you also have community and support, links to how to ask this question, how to open support, inquiries, um, and also how to authenticate here. I will show you, we give you an introduction. So documentation is well organized um, and it has all the API endpoints uh, documented, explained each one of them. If you click on them, we'll have the you know similar information to what I've showed you before. You can get access to it uh, here and start building your applications on top of these APIs. Um, conclusions. So as we've seen, APIs are sets of requirements that govern how one application can talk to another. It's a set of rules at the end of the day of how uh, an application can talk to the other, what type of information they're providing, how is it organized. Uh, and that's all documented for you to read on and, and to get familiar and to know how to use those APIs. We've had a look at REST, representational state transfer. It is an API framework built on HTTP. It's one of the most popular ones these days because it's easy, it's scalable, it's reliable, um, and it's familiar to a lot of people that have used HTTP and web servers for a long time. There are many options of working with REST APIs. We'll have a look at Postman on Thursday. Uh, Curl is also there, Request, like I was saying, Swagger, Spec. It's uh, that's self-documenting all the API endpoints that are available uh, with the API. The developer tools we'll have a look on Thursday. And then Cisco Catalyst SD-WAN breaks the control plane, switching fabric and IO modules into different components. That's for scalability purposes and also for making it easier to manage. Um, and then the uh, SD-WAN manager we've seen provides a programmable REST API interface. And we'll have a look at this on Thursday in much more detail with hands-on. We'll start interacting with the API, uh, get information, um, and I'll show you in Postman how to build your own uh, API requests. Um, and we'll have a look at that on Thursday. And then the, the Swagger documentation is available on the uh, manager itself at the slash API docs endpoint. And also we have it on developer.cisco.com slash doc slash SD1. It's all documented in there with also support links, uh, links to learning labs and all other resources that we have for you available for free, by the way. So thank you so much. Any questions that have come up, let me see. Uh, can we get the presentation slides? Yes, the slides are available uh, for download. Chima, any other questions that are there? Let's see. No, I think that is it. So if there aren't any other questions, uh, please do fill out the um, the polls. We've sent out 
a poll with five questions. Please let us know what you think about the session. Uh, on a scale of one to five, rate the session, the speaker, if you found it useful uh, or not, how we can make it better for you. But just a quick recap, we've gone over and we've had a look at APIs. What is an API? What is REST as one of the more, more popular API frameworks? Uh, what are the components that come with, uh, with REST? The URI, the headers, the body, the, uh, the status codes, right? So we had a look at that. Then we had the look at Cisco Catalyst SD-WAN fabrics, what are the components? We had a look at the validator, the controller, uh, the manager, right? And how they all have different roles. And then the manager exposes that REST API interface that gives you the option of programmatically interacting with your SD-WAN fabric um, and use those you know, REST API that it comes with it to actually start configuring, managing, uh, your SD-WAN fabric in a programmatic way. And we'll have a look at this in our workshop on Thursday. So if you haven't registered, please register for that. Uh, it's also going to be on Bright Talk, and I'm looking forward to seeing you there on Thursday. And also remember, all of this month, the month of June, is the um, SD-WAN Automation Awareness Month. So we have activities and webinars and workshop every single week of this month, starting this week. So we'll have this webinar, we'll have a workshop, and then next week also we'll have a webinar on Tuesday, workshop on Thursday, and the same on last week of June. So looking forward to seeing you all on this. Hope you found this useful. Thank you so much, and uh, see you on the next one. Take care, everyone. Bye.